Today we've got a real speaker. Uh, uh, I became very interested in, in Catalyst's work coming to Ryerson when I read, before I knew you, all of their spectacular work. Uh, and uh, I heard you speak last February, March, in my aggressive way. I introduced myself and uh, uh, said, I'm at Ryerson. I want you to come and teach and help me with my op-ed, which we did. And then we had a nice lunch in the summer. And you agreed to come, and you're here, first speaker. So. Uh, oh, I'm the first speaker. First speaker, because last week I don't count. I mean, I bored them to death last week. So uh, now we're going to have some meaties with someone much smarter than me. Although it's pretty low bar with me. But uh, you were going to say a few words at the beginning, yeah. and then we'll hit right in the questions. And uh, uh, and then Asher, you said there were some specific questions that may have come out of your earlier lecture that you want to point to. Yes, one of them. So, okay, so I'll, you'll tell me which one, and you'll, okay. We're ready to go. You're okay, on. Well, I'm, a, I'm a bit of a walker. So you you walk can here. walk here. Good. So uh, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me. I guess thank you, Ralph, for inviting me. My name is Tanya Van Beeson, and I am the executive director of Catalyst Canada. And for those of you who are not familiar with Catalyst, Catalyst is a not-for-profit. In fact, we are the leading not-for-profit globally that advocates for the advancement of women in business through workplace inclusion. It was founded in 1962. Fun fact, it was founded by a woman named Elise Schwartz, who is the mother of Tony Schwartz, who wrote The Art of the Deal with Donald Trump that he's now regretting terribly. And she's probably rolling over in her grave as a result of it. So she founded in 1962, and the, the genesis of the organization was really to encourage women into the workforce and then to support them once they were there. The organization has always been uh, a research house, so the underpinnings are research. In fact, probably a third of our staff are PhD academics who do primary research into identifying the barriers that may hold women back in the workplace. And over the last, I would say, 10 years, we've broadened that to see how those barriers may affect other groups in the workplace, so other underrepresented groups, whether it's people of color, people with disabilities, people from the LGBTQ community, et cetera. Um, and part of the reason why we did that is because women are not a homogeneous group of people either, so there are all these intersectionalities that affect women. Uh, in addition to the research that we do, we do advocacy work. So we do advocacy work with governments, uh, with the OECD, with the UN, with all kinds of organizations. And then um, the thing that keeps me and my team in Canada the busiest from a day-to-day -day basis is working directly with companies to affect culture change in the workplace. So we would work with many of the places that you guys may be seeking jobs at after your MBAs to make sure that those are, or at least to try to encourage as much inclusion in the cultures of those workplaces as possible. Um, so a little bit about me. I am the youngest of three kids. There were my two older brothers and then I came along and uh, we were immigrants to Canada. My parents always valued education a great deal and so they set some ground rules for us when we were kids that we should all work very hard at school. We were all to attend university, that was never a question, and we were certainly supposed to get a degree, and preferably two. And then we were supposed to go out and build strong and successful careers. And um, my parents never saw us as having jobs, they always saw us as having careers. So that was a very important kind of theme in where I grew up. So actually, at the age of 32, I was the most shocked when I was 10 years into my professional career. I had two uh, degrees, an undergraduate and a graduate degree, and I, had, um, I was pregnant with my first child. And my parents turned around and said, when are you going to stop working to take care of your family? And I honestly, it was one of those moments where I was like, what? Uh, I don't remember you asking my two brothers that question when they started their families. So it was a really, it was the f first time in my life that I had to confront the fact, I mean, luckily for me, but it was the first time in my life that I had to confront the fact that I was different from my brothers. It had never occurred to me before that I was different from my brothers. And that the expectations that were set for them were actually quite different than the ones that were set for me. And so the, my takeaway from that conversation, which was a little bit tenuous at the time, but we got over it, was spend the first 32 years of your life working as hard as you can. You know, work really, really hard at school, uh, work really, really hard in your professional career, really build something, and then shut all of that motivation and drive down when you have a kid. And the only reason why is 
because I was a girl. So that seemed really odd to me. Now, I didn't stop working. I actually continued on with my career. I'd started at Procter & Gamble, and then um, at about the five-year mark, I switched into professional services. And I ultimately became a partner with the global executive search firm Spencer Stewart. So for 21 years, I was in the ex executive search business, and I co-led the Canadian financial services practice, and I also did a lot of board work. And in the last 10 years of my time there, um, what I found was more and more clients were asking for gender diversity on their slates of candidates, whether it be for senior executives or for board directors. Um, and if it was either an important part of the brief or actually a critical part of the brief, which I found quite encouraging. Um, and I really thought it was a step change in the momentum towards creating gender equality in the workplace. But there were always two refrains that I heard over and over that were disconcerting in my mind, and they kind of went like this. My clients would say, Tanya, we really want a woman for this job, but we don't want to compromise on quality. Or we'd really like to get a woman on our board, but she's got to fit with our culture. So if you step back from that, you know, they were saying, yeah, we'd love to get a woman, but gee, if, if, if she's really going to take our quality factor down, or if she's going to mess with our culture, then we probably can't deal with that. Anyway, long story short, I, last year I decided to make the move from Spencer Stewart to Catalyst, um, and I didn't do it for the money, I can promise you that, but now I, uh, I am full-time advocating for both gender and broadly inclusion in the workplace. It's a slow process, and we can talk about that a little bit today. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your questions addressed the, the slow progress we're making. Um, but it's incredibly satisfying. And for those of you who ever think you may want to go into not-for-profit, I'm definitely the living example of something that can be really, really satisfying. Thank you. We're ready to go. Uh, the first series of questions, we had, uh, Asher, all kinds of questions that were the same. Usually you have a TA that cuts them out. Now I got uh, all these same questions, and I'm going to choose one. Well, it's because we've been in the news recently. Yeah, you've definitely been in the news. So the first question, it was a bunch of them on a guy called Victor Dodig, who's uh, CEO of one of the six big banks, heavy duty guy. And. Uh, Apparently made him chairman, and then uh, kind of a silly question, but uh, uh, you you have, and I'll give you my views. Uh, where's Kyle Cormier? Where's Kyle? There you are, Kyle. Hi, Kyle. Hello, Tanya. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Um, there was an article written in the Hamilton Spectator a couple weeks ago, entitled "Another Man Named Head of Canadian Women's Advisory Board." The article was highly critical of Catalyst hiring CIBC's chief executive, Victor Dodig, as chair of your advisory board uh, to replace Bank of Montreal's Bill Down, who are both men. However, last June, a report on CIBC's management shakeup disclosed Christina Kramer was prompted to group head, or promoted to group head, overseeing the bank's retail operations. She replaced David Williamson, who was a former contender for CEO of CIBC. Many within CIBC believe Christina Kramer will be the first woman CEO after Victor Dodig. My question is, will, uh, was this a strategic hire for Catalyst to ensure that Christina Kramer will become the first woman CEO of a major Canadian bank? It's a very interesting question, but the answer is no. <laughs> Um, and maybe let me let me explain a little more about that. So you've you've brought together two very interesting things, and I will decouple them because they really they they weren't related events. Um, maybe we can park the why is Victor Dodig chair of our advisory board for a second because I'm happy to talk about that. But the the there's a really interesting story behind the Christina Kramer appointment. Um, when Victor Dodig became CEO of the bank in 2014, maybe about a year later year, year and a half later, he went to his HR team and he said, if I want a, he didn't say if, he said, I want a gender balance slate, succession slate for my role when I leave the bank. Now, nobody knows when he's going to leave the bank necessarily, and he's a relatively young guy, but HR went scrambling and they went to look at all of their succession lists and their hypo lists and who was where and so on. And they came back to him and they said, if you leave the bank within eight years, we will not be able to do that. 
So he said, okay, we gotta make changes. So that, sh that management shakeup that you referred to where Christina was uh, elevated and Dave Williamson, who actually people thought would be Victor's successor, was moved into another, or was moved out, um, was a very conscious decision on his part to move women into big operating roles so that he could create that opportunity for a gender balanced slate. So and I do you go back. Go, about and that, well, that's the one I'm interested in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so the Catalyst Advisory Board in Canada has um, CEOs of some of the most influential companies in the country. In fact, I would tell you, uh, and you can ask others. I think we have the most powerful board in Canada. Um, we meet twice a year, okay? Now, it's an advisory board. It's not like a, a board of, of a public, public company. It's an advisory board. Um, but you're quite right. Victor succeeds Bill Down, who had been the previous chair of the advisory board and is also a bank CEO, a male bank CEO. Um, and there, was a there were a couple of specific reasons why I felt this was a good idea. Um, and I'll start with the most important one, to me anyway. Um, I believe so deeply that gender inequality is not a women's issue and that it is a, it's society's issue. That, that is sort of core to my fiber. And so I believe that if I can, as I, I mean, I run the organization, so I'm a strong woman. If I can get a man with power to stand shoulder to shoulder with me and at, and, and acknowledge publicly that he believes this is as much his problem as it is mine, then I see that as a very powerful thing. And then if further he will put his reputation on the line um, as we're trying to make change, I see that as an incredibly powerful thing. So that was number one. And that's not that we couldn't have had a female chair. Of course we could. Um, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the chair piece is really, you're first among equals on the advisory board. Um, but he has been extremely vocal publicly. He is the chair of the 30% Club, who we are trying to work more closely with, so bringing those two voices together was also very helpful. And, I mean, I guess the third reason is, in Canada, bank CEOs have access to everybody. Right? They can talk to any CEO of any business anywhere because they either bank them or they want to bank them or they have enough influence to throw around. And so that's, that's helpful, particularly in uh, a society where 95% of CEOs are men. So uh, one, of the, one of the things that Victor has done at CIBC is he has been the first... Canadian CEO to launch a program called Mark Leaders, which is a catalyst program. It stands for Men Advocating Real Change. And it's a one and a half day immersive program that leaders like Victor put their male leaders through. And it really sort of explores masculinity in today's environment and things like privilege. And it, it's a really... Um, it's based on about seven or eight years of catalyst research around the importance of engaging men in this discussion. And it's really transformative from a culture perspective. And he did it first with the capital markets guys, which in a bank is the most, you know, kind of the still most male dominated area of the bank. So he's taken some real steps to make change and that was really meaningful to me. Was it the media? who wrote a bunch of articles saying, uh, you're a woman's organization and when you have a woman at the head. Is that to what triggered the six questions here? Yes. Yeah, so uh, the, it started with Bloomberg, then the Star picked it up, and then various uh, organizations around the country picked it up. The CBC ran three stories on it. Okay. Okay, we've got the next area. Again, a bunch of questions that are pretty much the same. On well, and Ralph, I would say to anyone in the room who thinks I'm wrong or wants to challenge that point of view, I'm very open to that discussion because I think this is a really important discussion. Is where do we all belong in this conversation? And, and what, like a lot of women said to me, it's fine to have Victor, just don't have him in a leadership role, right? So I think we all come at this a little bit differently, and I'm more than happy to have that conversation. I think it's a dumb thing. I think he's the absolute right choice in the short term your organization uh, to get a guy speaking out uh, and get old guys like me speaking out. The end, you're going to get a better result, I think. Uh, so I think he was a great choice. And you got six big banks in this country. So you get one of those guys, uh, he's powerful. People listen, his customers listen. So I think it's the right choice. And uh, He might be biased, though. 
Well, why would I be biased? I'm just looking at results. And then I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about comply or explain the fact that we've gone from 12 to 14% women on boards in Ontario, which well, is- Nationally. Nationally, it's yeah. still a shitty number, bad number. Excuse my language, I get upset. Uh, what did I get upset last week? What did I say? Because I hear it saying, well, there's not enough quality women to go around. I think I might have said horse shit, something like that, because uh, I was upset. But they won't remember what I said. But uh, let's talk about uh, quotas. And there was a good general question to start it from Tao Jiang. Where's Tao Jiang? Hi, Tanya. Hi, Tao. Uh, Quota system can help improving the gender balance in a boardroom, uh, but some people, including women, argue that selecting board members should be based on merit, not quota. Uh, Jill Seymour, a member of a European Parliament, said in her speech, "Quota system it is demeaning and insulting to all hardworking women." So, what is your opinion of quota system? Thank you. Thank you. Oh, this is a hard one. Um, so again, let me let me take a couple of elements of your question, Tao. Um, you make the point that some people argue that selecting board members should be based on merit and not on quotas. So the first thing I would say is, if any of you have followed what's happened with the Ontario Securities Commission Comply or Explain rule, that's, I'll give you just a little bit of background. So that's been around now for almost three years. And annually, the OSC does a review of the results that come back in, and it's, it's a disclosure rule. It asks companies whether they have a diversity policy, if they have it, what is it, whether they set targets for female representation at the board and executive levels, if so, what are those targets. There are six elements that they ask companies to disclose, and if they don't have those things, they have to explain why they do not, okay? Now, if you look at the explanations, the number one reason for uh, companies who do not have diversity policies or targets or et cetera is that, quote, we are a meritocracy. Now, a meritocracy is defined by the people in power. It's a very subjective thing, meritocracy, right? You and I will all define merit quite differently. And so it is the great giant bucket of unconscious bias. So I, I don't see the opposite of quota as merit at all. I don't think that they are two ends of a continuum. I think merit is fraught with difficulty, very difficult to, to define, and very much in the eye of the beholder. That's the first thing I would say. Um, with respect to quotas, quotas are effective. I mean, quotas are, the it's a legislated thing, it's a law, and therefore companies do what they're told. They are, they will address, if, if we impose quotas in Canada, they will address the representation of women on boards and we will see results quickly. The, the downside of quotas, quite frankly, and we've seen this in other jurisdictions, is that they don't necessarily have a knock-on effect to senior executive, in this case, women. And you could insert you know, any group here, whether we're talking about black professionals or we're talking about people with disabilities, any quota system will address the near-term problem, but the question is, does it address the behavioral and the cultural change that underpins the problem? And so far, when we look at other countries, it's not obvious that that behavioral attitudinal change has actually taken hold. So what's my point of view? My point of view is as follows. I'm, a, I'm an inherently optimistic person, and I believe that there are so few problems in the world we can fix that I just wish Canadian businesses would seize on this one because it's imminently fixable. And I do think that you know it is well within the power of these companies to make this happen. I worry, given the results that Ralph just talked about, that the federal government is going to get sick and tired of hearing the excuses. And if the, if the Trudeau government comes into a second term, I think it's possible they'll impose quotas. Okay. I want to follow up on, on that with a question uh, that Alison Hunt has, and then I, I want you, she alludes to Norway, but I want you to give us a further explanation. Uh, where's Alison? Oh, thank you so much. 
Hi, Tanya. Um, I think you touched on this a bit, but um, we read a um, the Gender and Economy article, the debate about quotas, yeah. um, and they had research from Norway um, to illustrate evidence that there is no trickle-down uh, benefit from more women being represented on corporate board of directors to women being represented in lower levels of the organization. Mm -hmm. So with your experience in corporate leadership, um, can you provide some insight into why an increase in women on the boards didn't trans translate into um, an increase in women throughout the company, and whether or not you think there's potential for success with this method? The quota method, you mean? Yeah, well, specifically with the trickle down, like why it's not working. Right. So I think there's a couple of reasons. One, Norway's a small country, and so I don't know if you guys have ever heard of the term golden skirts, but when the Norwegian government put in place the quota system and gave companies five years to adhere to it, what happened is a lot of the women that were in senior executive roles in companies in Norway were invited to be on boards, some of them more than one board, and decided to leave their executive roles because now all of a sudden they had a career as a board director. So uh, there was a hollowing out of the executive suite of women to fulfill the board requirements and there wasn't an immediate pipeline of women to backfill those women in those executive roles. So that's one reason. So it is possible that given more time we may see that you know balance out. But I, my darker suspicion is that um, not enough ad attitudinal change has taken place for this to have a true trickle-down effect. And in fact, I was just, so Sarah Kaplan, who's referenced in that um, piece, uh, she's a professor at U of T, and last week I was at U of T with her, and they had a professor from Harvard, Dr. Frank Dobbin, speaking. And he's done a lot of research around the impact of um, imposing mandatory, whether it's training or quotas or what have you, on people, and the effect that that has, and often it has a negative effect. In other words, you know, when your mother told you to practice your piano, you really didn't want to, but if you went alone to practice your piano, then you were much more motivated to do it. I think those human tendencies extend into these kinds of mandatory interventions, and so what I worry about is that, yes, the quota system fixed the immediate problem, but again, that behavioral change coming behind it is not obvious. Yeah. So to your last question, though, you said, is there potential for success? Uh, one of the things that Frank, that Professor Dobbin talks about is if you're going to implement a mandatory change, like a quota or, you know, everybody has to attend diversity training this Friday at noon or what have you, couple it with other kinds of, of opportunities that engages people in a more natural way. An example of that would be um, something that's very powerful in organizations today, sponsorship programs. So when you have a senior leader sponsoring an up and coming leader, that and it's a one-on-one -on -one relationship, but that senior leader all of a sudden starts to feel direct responsibility for the success of this person coming up, right? So maybe you do that with a man and a woman, maybe you do that with a white leader and a black up and coming leader, but you start to try and introduce people that, ha that have differences but also share commonalities, whether it's they work in the same department or they work in, I don't know, the same, uh, on the same oil rig or whatever, so that people start to just simply become invested in other people. That's an easier thing to do and a more natural thing to do. Can I ask you a question on something on uh, unconscious bias? I mean, I, I've been around a long time and I've seen it uh, in a law firm, when we're hiring students or making people partners. I've seen it in political when we're choosing candidates. You take a man and woman candidate and you'll hear somebody say, you know what, she's just too aggressive, too pushy. Same guy, he's aggressive, but that's what leadership is, same thing. I mean, I've heard that for years. So I read, I think it was the Catalyst article that uh, well researched too long. I uh, I read the first <laughs> ten pages. I want my take students that back. give me a summary here, and I got a summary. But I actually went 
to the law firm, Gowlings, where I work with, managing partner's woman. I said, I read this big article, do we do anything? I mean, uh, she says we actually do. She says uh, uh, we've trained, we brought in some outside people to train our managers and department head leaders. We also, when we're interviewing articling students, set a group of young lawyers around, and we have uh, an unconscious bias person in the room who calls out when the guy says, you know what, she's just not going to fit with us here. Excuse me, tell me why. So we're actually doing something which is unusual for, because I asked her, I said, are the other law firms, because we're pretty revenue cost, and says, it's not going to make us any money having an unconscious bias person. What's the story on unconscious bias? Do I know what I'm talking about? No, I think you're on the right track. So that double blind article. That was the right answer. Thank you. I, I apologize that that was long. I um, but so that I, that's a very that still applies. It's a little bit of the Goldilocks theory of you know women are they're they're too hard or they're too soft. They're never just right. Um, regardless of your politics, I think we saw some of that with Hillary Clinton. You know, she wears pantsuits. She does this. I mean, you know, not stuff that people are talking about generally where men are concerned. But um, it's a it's a very big issue, unconscious bias, and for organizations that are trying to affect change, an unconscious bias spotter would be a common thing to have. And the reality is we are all biased. We are all biased. And we will all be biased for the rest of our lives. So to try and eradicate bias is impossible and ridiculous. What you can do is you can look at your processes and systems in companies and try and remove the bias from those. Because we as people will continue to be biased. We can try and address it. And certainly through training and awareness, that helps. But it's not really, it's unconscious bias is not a problem of awareness or trying hard. That helps, but it will not get rid of it. So we have to look at the interventions that take them out of the systems that we have in the workplace. And let me give you an example, Asher, you probably heard this one, but um, it's a beautiful example. Back in the 1950s and 60s, the, the five biggest orchestras in the U.S., um, wanted to bring more women into their orchestras. Each orchestra is about 100 people, and all of them had no more than five female musicians. So they all undertook an effort to increase the number of women in their orchestras. Up until that point, it was the musical director who chose the musicians, and those musical directors had a network of about six or seven music teachers around the U.S. that they sourced students from. So the, the pipe was very small, right? They were not choosing from, I'm sure they were talking to what was considered the very best teachers around the country, but that's how the students were coming into the, the feeding pool. So what they did is they decided, okay, we're going to do blind auditions. We're going to have the musicians uh, perform behind a screen. We're going to sit on the other side of it. And we're also going to expand beyond the music director. So we're going to have the music director plus a number of panelists listening to the music. So this, this actually made a substantial change. What they found is that they improved the, they took up by 50% the number of women who went from the first interview or the first audition, if you will, to the final audition. But ultimately, the results were not that meaningful. They got a few more women, but they were not that meaningful. What they did, again, and it takes real um, thought to do this, is one of the panelists said, do you know, I can tell if it's a man or a woman by the clickety-clack of their heels when they walk onto the stage. So what they did is they asked the musicians to remove their shoes before they came onto the stage behind the screen so that it was now very, you know, basically impossible to tell if it was a man or a woman. And that made the biggest step change in representation. So it, it, it's, it takes effort and real thought to figure out the, the right interventions to remove the bias. Okay, next question from Shannon Conway. You're smiling. You seem like excited, like yeah. I told you. <laughs> Hi, Tanya. Hi. 
Uh, so you have been pioneering change and inclusion in the workplace for over a decade with your work at Spencer Stewart, as well as your work at Catalyst. I'd like to know what, in your opinion, has been the most important project you've worked on and why? I saw this question. I thought, oh my god, I don't know. Um, so let me focus on the ones that come to mind. Um, first of all, our global CEO, Deborah Gillis, is a, is a Canadian. She was in my job 11 years ago because she's my placement. I worked at Spencer Stewart and I put her in that job and she's gone to, on to become the global CEO. So that was a good one. Um, but then one of the ones that, to be honest, was the most memorable was for one of the large Canadian banks. They were looking for a senior executive to run their biggest banking region. And the hiring manager, who was the COO, said to us, I don't want to meet any men at all. Which, And I apologize to the men in the room, because I, I'm married to a man. I birthed a man. I, it's not that I'm anti-men, but this is just how the story goes. And um, we were having challenges finding a full slate of qualified candidates that were purely women. In fact, the preponderance of people holding the kinds of positions he was interested in were men. Um, and he sent us back to the well and back to the well and back to the well. And it was a real learning experience for me in search because search professionals, like so many other professionals, suffer from the rush to solve bias, right? You want to you, you wanna get the project done, you want to move on to the next thing, you want to make the project as profitable as possible, whatever. And we ended up with an incredibly fantastic placement who's gone on to do great things in this organization. Um, but if he hadn't pushed me that hard, and shame on me, you'd think I would be the one looking for the, the great woman. But I, you know, I probably would have settled on, on uh, another outcome that didn't force me to look as hard for the talent. So, And that's, that's actually the point I make to people about targets, because people confuse targets and quotas. They're not the same thing. A target is exactly the same thing as any other business objective. You have revenue targets, you have you know, uh, net income targets, you have targets of all kinds in business. Uh, your representation targets are exactly the same. They are the goals that you are seeking to work towards, and what gets measured gets done. It's not a quota. It's not legislated. When people say, well, I'm going to hire the wrong person because I have a target. No, I'm not asking you to do that. What I'm asking you to do is look much harder for the talent that's out there. Sometimes it's not going to work out. Right? So you're going to look harder the next time. But it's a target, just like anything else we do in business. Can I ask you a question? You probably won't know the answer, but they'll Google and tell me the answer. I do a lot of work in the area of sports, and I'm looking at the issue of women in sports. And we have, if you take a look at Major League Baseball, the NFL, basketball and hockey, probably 120 teams, how many women CEOs would you think they are of those 120 teams? Recognizing to become a CEO of a sports team, it's not like you're an ex-player. You've usually come from the marketing, the finance, the legal department, whatever. How many women do you think there would be? And uh, you know. I mean, the only CEO I can think of is Stacy Allister, who's a Canadian. She was the. CEO. But she was tennis. 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 But I'm talking about the four huh. major sports. Is there one? They, I do when, when, like, when they, Google when they, away. Yeah, Google away. You'll tell us after class what they found last year, and it may have changed. And I don't count uh, if you're, well, I don't want to say it. So I think, uh, uh, what, Jerry? Jerry Turk left Bell and went to the NFL. But I don't think she's a CEO of a team. She's working for the NFL. Oh, right. So Mary Turk spoke at this class. No, I think that it was interesting. There were none. There was a woman interesting who worked for, you probably wouldn't have heard of this guy, Al Davis was the owner of the Oakland Raiders, mean, tough guy. He had a woman CEO. It'll show up, one of the students last year found it, and then his son took over the team and he axed her. And so I think the only one, it might be the owner in Buffalo's wife, Puglia. I don't really count to count that if you're an owner. And I think Jerry Buss's daughter at one time, but she may not be, she asked her brother, I mean, but I, I'd be interested after the class, take a look and- uh, not there anymore. Uh, she runs the Lakers stuff. Oh, oh, there you go, nice. What did he find? She runs the Lakers. Jeannie Buss still runs the Lakers. That's, she is, so she is, so we have one out of 120. Google and see if you can find any more here, that would be, but well, that's like a really bad number. You should, do, why don't you do some research on that? Uh, uh, <laughs> No, but it, it, we'll ask next week, Michael Frisdale, CEO of Maple Leaf Sports, and what 
I had Tim Lewicki here when he ran Leafs, and they said, oh, four of my six management team are, uh, are female, but none of them make it to the top. And no one's raised it as an issue other than me. So I got no influence here. Uh, Ma Manur Imran. Yeah, right over there. Uh, in order to keep up with the norms of our society, a single income household is not economically feasible. In households where men and women both work, the culturally nurtured roles imply that women still have to do the second shift, i.e. household work. As a recognized leader in promoting diversity, how have you addressed that sociological challenge that undermine women today? So thank you for that question, Manor. Um, I've, I'll ring fence it a little bit by saying that Catalyst's work is about women in the workplace, right? So we, the work that we do is actually directed at workplaces. So we do talk to workplaces extensively about um, parental leave and family care and those kinds of things because those are all flex care, flex work, on-ramp, off-ramp type programs because those all affect the workplace. But some of what you're talking about is societal in nature, where government has a role to play. Um, so I try to do that as much as I can. I just sat on the Ontario Gender Wage Gap Committee where we talked extensively about family care. And family care is not just children, it is, it's aging parents, it is people with disabilities. It, you know, all of us will have different situations where that's concerned. Uh, but you've raised a very, very important point. And again, if you look at Scandinavian countries, um, in some cases, I think it's Norway again, or maybe it's Sweden, they have legislated parental care where um, you use it or lose it. So in heteronormative couples, fathers are expected to take half of the family care time and mothers the other half. And the effect that that has is that when a hiring manager is looking to hire someone, they become indifferent to whether it's a man or a woman because they know that either one of them could end up taking time off for family care. Whereas in North America, it is generally the female that does that, again, in a heteronormative uh, couple. So uh, those are the kinds of interventions that we've seen in other places. You know, will we see that in Canada? I don't know. We're not accustomed to the same degree of government intervention that some of these Scandinavian countries and European countries are used to. Um, but these are all strategies for leveling the playing field and making it easier for both genders to participate fully. I also would say, Ralph, sorry, I'm running on, but I would also say that what's some of the barriers holding women back are starting to hurt men. So you guys are all much younger, and now I'm speaking to the men in the room. You're, you're much younger than I am, but you know, if your intention over time is to have a family, or even if it's not, but you, again, you have family members you want to you um, be involved with, whether it's parents or, or nieces or nephews or what have you, um, it's not acceptable in North American society yet to be that guy that leaves work early, or to be that guy that wants flex time, or to be that guy that maybe stays at home. Right? We're, we're working towards that, but there's still a stigma associated with that, certainly in some industries and in some functions. Um, a good example, I was in Vancouver the other day, and uh, one of the CEOs of one of the companies I was meeting with, his head of legal told me, you know, our CEO sometimes leaves at 3.30 in the afternoon to take his daughter to soccer, but he doesn't tell anybody. It's kind of done on the down low. Well, that's... That's not helpful, right? That is not helping other people realize that they can do the same thing and catch up on the couple of hours that they missed at 8.30 at night, because the reality is that's frankly how we all work. And so that's, that's part of the issue. And I would say as, as this next generation comes through and men want to be much more involved in their family lives, these are things that are cutting them too. I think, uh, I think a lot of it's generational. I mean, my generation, which is fortunately extinct, my wife tells me I, I never changed a diaper, and she tells me that all the time. It's probably true. I got three kids here. The young lawyers in, in our office, uh, guy will say, I've, I've got to leave, I've got to pick the kids up because my wife is a lawyer at another firm, and gone. So I think it's, it's changing generationally. I mean, I was, uh, I'm like a dinosaur, but I'm improving. 
It is, I think it is changing generationally, but if you guys go to, you know, let's say you decide to go into investment banking, it hasn't changed that much. Okay, I have a question from Krishna that, and I want you to remember, we got a, a lady by the name of Kathleen Wynne showing up here in a couple weeks, and I want you to hammer her because we're going to knock her out of the box here. But on, on the question of uh, women on boards, and as a follow-up, you're going to give us an answer. You might tell us some stuff we should ask her and put her uh, to say, you know, do something. Don't just stand there, politician. So where's Krishna? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. So my question is, as per Statistics Canada, there is no shortage of board-ready women in Canada. Countless women across country possess skills and experiences that are highly valuable for corporate boards. Despite the tremendous efforts of Can Catalyst Canada to increase the percentage of women on board, nearly half of the TXS companies have men, uh, all men at its board. So as the Canadian Diversity Practice Lead of Catalyst Canada, how you are planning to address this issue? what I do all day, every day. <laughs> um, how am I planning to address this issue? So a whole bunch of things. Um, we are just launching something called the Catalyst Accord. The Catalyst Accord is asking companies, it's actually aligned with the 30% Club, and it's asking companies to publicly pledge to set targets for women on their boards and women in senior exec or in executive roles. Um, with the aspiration that we can lift the FP500 to 30% representation in both of those realms, boards and executive roles. The reason why I'm asking them to do this publicly is because I think once you state it publicly, you feel more responsibility to deliver on it. And I am asking them to uh, share their results on an annual basis with me so I can start tracking progress and start encouraging them and, and basically you know, trying to make it a more personal decision. So that's number one. Catalyst has a, something called Women on Board. It's a program where we pair corporate board-ready women with actual sitting Canadian directors. And the idea is that Canadian director will open up his or her, primarily his, but his or her network to help that aspiring director get on a board. So it's an actual tangible action plan. Um, I try and influence policy at the government level. I work with companies every single day to try and affect change. Um, I do speaking engagements like sometimes three times a day. So a lot of it is just you know sitting with people trying to change hearts and minds. But some, I was on a panel the other day and someone said something very interesting, which is that when you are, when, when one is accustomed to privilege, then equality feels like oppression. And I think that is exactly what we're facing here, right? If you're used to being on a board and being chosen for a board and it's kind of comfy and you like the lunches and you like the people you hang out with, why give that up? And that's our problem. Now, I also think there are other things we can do, and I'm working with the Ontario Securities Commission right now to try and tighten up the language around comply or explain to see if we can get far more transparency behind that we are a meritocracy box. In fact, I'd love to see them eliminate that altogether. I also think Canada needs more um, structured rules around board turnover. So, for instance, board term limits are not regulated or legislated in this country, which means that you can sit on a board for 30 years. And frankly, I don't care if you're a man or a woman, 30 years is way too long to sit on a board. You're no longer an independent board director, and so that's poor board governance. So I think we need, whether it's mandatory term limits or age limits, and I will tell you, Ralph, I'm a fan of term limits, not so much age limits, um, but I think we need some, we need some renewal mechanisms. Um, the other thing I think we need to do is boards need to get better at board assessment, and it, it, takes, a, it takes a courageous chair to really do board assessment properly where you are, you know, maybe you're asking a board director to leave because they're just taking up a chair and they're not being very effective, right? We need more of these renewal mechanisms to create renewal in the board realm. Yeah, we had this discussion at lunch and uh, I'm not sure I am with respect to term limits. Specifically, I've seen it not work with charities where uh, I told you I sat on the board of TIF for 25 years and I wanted to get off. I was writing a check for 15 grand every year and had to go to movies. But uh, uh, fortunately, and they wouldn't let me off because we raised a big chunk of money to build Tiff Bell Lightbox. And we went out, did a corporate governance, and they came up with term limits. 
and I got off, and a bunch of really good board members on a not-for-profit. You lose track. None of us write a check anymore. None of us are involved in the organization. Uh, we did a lot of free government relations for them, uh, whatever. So they lost really good people because they went to, and, they, and once you go, it's like there was a baseball strike. Remember all the people who used to go to baseball games? When they had the strike, I had friends who used to go to couples, husband and wife, 50 to 60 games a year. And they did it since 1977. They went to zero. So on, on not-for-profits, I worry that you will lose people. I, I can understand That's fair. it. And you know what? Generally, in those kinds of regulations, you can, you can ask for exceptions mm -hmm. for certain reasons. Right. But I think in a corporate board setting where people aren't cutting checks, Right. It should be a different approach. This is a long question, but I, I'm going to have them ask it because they didn't know what it was, and then I found it was interesting. They had a title, Women in STEM. Mm -hmm. right, so I had to Google S-T-E-M, and I found out what it was. So where's Rupin? This is the longest question of all time, but, uh, uh, but because it was STEM and I know what it is, and it was interesting, you, where is Rupin? Well, you're the guy. You talked to me last week at the end yeah, of the yeah, class yeah. about this Victor thing. Was, That's right. Yeah. So you were ahead of your time by a week there. <laughs> okay, Rupin, fire it up. Well, welcome and thank you for coming. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go a little bit back here to get some background here. It's fine to say that we need more women representation on company boards and in senior management. However, when our future economic health is linked to STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, and the talent pool is so limited because of underrepresentation of females in STEM fields. What are your recommendations on seeing more females entering STEM fields in education and into the C-suite of STEM businesses? This That's a short version of what you had here. That's well, a, there's a there's better a, version. I like it. Good. The right question because. Yeah. No. This is a real passion project of mine. Um, so I too will offer a little bit of background. Um, Canada, as many of you may know, is facing a quite a severe talent crisis. We have a, a, a shrinking talent base owing to a, uh, an aging population and a declining birth rate. Right, so we are not—we're not creating more people, which is problematic. Uh, we also, and in fact, this year I think was the first year where Canada reported more people over the age of 65 than people under the age of 50, and that delta will continue to grow for quite a while longer. At the same time, we are uh, facing an intense amount of competition from an increasingly well-educated world. So by 2030, there will be three, it's estimated that there will be 300 million post-secondary graduates around the world, and a full 50% of those will come from India and China, 8% will come from the US, and 1% will come from Canada. So all of that's happening here. At the same time, Canada is lagging its uh, other OECD countries in terms of both innovation and productivity. So we rank on the World Global Economic Forum's Competitiveness Index. We rank 22nd in innovation and a 27th in private sector R&D. So I think this is a great question, Ruben. How are we as Canadians going to secure the future of this country in a sustainable way? How are we going to find the skilled, uh, highly trained, highly educated people that we need to feed STEM fields and, and many other fields? And Canada has clearly turned to immigration. I think, I think Ryerson is a fantastic example of how diverse you know, this city is and how diverse this school is. So immigration is a key part of the Canadian strategy. And in fact, a full two-thirds of our population growth in Canada is now driven by the arrival of new Canadians. That number, which is about 250,000 Canadians a year, equals the number of people we are currently retiring. But in a few years, we're going to start retiring about 400,000 people. And so, we're, again, we're going to have a delta. So in, um, uh, immigration alone is not going to meet the needs. So these are all huge problems. Um, and so I'm very passionate about STEM. I've got a couple of problems. I, I, again, when I, I have to ring fence a little bit what I say because I focus on the workplace. I would love to talk about what happens to kids at the age of six when they're thinking about whether they're good in math or not, or at the age of 15, or what their experiences are at university, but it's not the focus of Catalyst. What we focus on is the women that actually do go into STEM-related jobs, what is their work 
What's, what's the in the work environment experience once they get there? And as you've probably read by a lot of headlines of you know, well-known companies, it's not that great. So we're trying to address what that work culture experience is. Um, I have had an opportunity to speak to a few engineering classes, and I've heard a lot of horror stories about women in those classes and some dropping out. And um, so there is still a really big issue um, in STEM that is culturally based. Um, it's in society, and and I think the whole Silicon Valley thing has created this sort of bro culture that that that's not very productive. So what am I doing about it? I'm trying to work with tech companies to ensure that they have the healthiest cultures they can possibly have. And then we try and encourage companies to build scholarship programs to encourage more women into STEM. Um, those are the kinds of interventions that we're working on. But you've addressed a really, really important issue. I'm going to do something that I try sometime. I tried it last year. So we only have time for a couple more questions. So I want to ask someone who hasn't asked their question that thinks, number one, they have a really good question, and uh, uh, but there's a risk to that, because sometimes I say, that wasn't that good a question, and you as classmates have an ability to boo them if they don't think. So who has the confidence to be able to step up and say, you know what, I have a really good question that I want to st Oh, we got, we got two, oh, okay. Two. We got two brave ones. Now, what's, what's your name? Well, you got to get your microphone. This is, I may tell you it's a bad question. You may not like me, but, uh, but that's, you're brave. I'm, I'm very that's impressed. That's okay. I can be booed. Ralph, is the question that I wanted you to pick? Oh, well, so if yeah. he liked your question, I oh. won't like your oh, question. It's relevant to what we talked about earlier. Oh, that's oh. stuff on the board that I missed. Okay, go for it. Fire it up. So in different, well, first of all, thank you. In different occasions and speeches, you have mentioned that companies with women on board or more, div more diversity on board result in better financial performance. The articles I have read show that there is a correlation between the women on board and better financial performance, but not a cause-effect relationship. I suspect there are some CEOs who have argued this point with you already, but would you please tell us what your answer was to them? That, that is a good question. Uh, you were next to get chosen, and I said it was a good question. Unfortunately, if he's more important, because he marks. They don't let me mark here. I'd be too easy. I'd, what do you get? Two out of, uh, they, how many marks do they get for their questions? One, One mark. So you don't really have to care that much if you could get a zero or <laughs> whatever. I care about this one. Okay, but this, well, this one, you bet she, did she get a one? Do you give someone a half? Is that what you get? A zero? Mean guy, okay. <laughs> so this, this nice lady gets a one, okay? Uh, so you're absolutely right. We get challenged on that all the time. I, I would, so I'll tell you what I would say to a CEO, and then I'll tell you what I really think. <laughs> and they're sort of related. Um, what I would say to a CEO is that people make decisions on the basis of correlation every day. Uh, it, very specifically, investment managers, mutual fund investors, institutional investors make big decisions on the basis of correlation every day. So to simply say that something can only be good or right to pursue because there's causation, I think is a very narrow view of the world and ignores most of what the investing community does. So that's what I would say uh, there. And you know, the reality is there's so much credible research, whether it's from us or Harvard or Credit Suisse or Goldman Sachs or you, know, you name it, any one of the, the organization, MSCI, they've all run the numbers and come out with the same outcomes. So that's what I would say there. Um, personally, what I struggle with is when we go down the uh, path of discussing the business case for greater gender representation on boards or any kind of greater representation on boards, I, I feel like I die a little bit inside every day. And the reason why is because, well, it's multifold. No one is demanding a business case for met all men on a board, right? That's just acceptable. So my view is, provided we're not removing value from the company, if it's as good or better, then there should be no discussion. 
Um, you know, women are full partners in society. We earn 60% of universities or degrees. There is simply no good reason why we can't have an equal representation and voice at the table. So the business case argument to me is fraught with difficulty and denies the fact that I think this, this comes down to what is truly right and fair in a society. Okay. Last question. You, there was a guy at the back. Are you... Which was, you're the guy. Do you think it's a really good, because this lady was like really good. Now, do you want to take a risk and, and have the wrath of your classmates? Uh, <laughs> no, no, come on. We're, we're going to try it. Now, you may get booed. I mean, that's, that's uh, you know, <laughs> failure. I've had a lot of failures, so let's, yeah. uh, but let's go. We're going to give you a fair chance. Okay. You passed. Let's go for it. See if this guy gets a, a 0.5 or a 0 here. <laughs> okay, thank you, Taya. From your conversation so far, it looks as if the government has a lot to do to bring in women to the C-suites. But in Germany, Angela Merkel has been there for 12 years. She's won another term now. She's the most powerful woman in the world. She has the most powerful, she's the most powerful female Democrats. Yet in Germany, you have very few women in company boardrooms. So why is it that in a country like Germany, they've not been able to get a woman to occupy more positions, even though the president or chancellor is a female? That's a really good, really good question. That guy, give that guy a, a one here. <laughs> Germany, I'm lobbying they, for people to do, get a one. I can't believe they that. They do have a representation rule in Germany, I'm pretty sure. Politics, yes, but in the not so much. So, uh, so just to, so that I can clarify your question, your question is, when you have someone of her stature and power, why is it that we're not seeing the same kind of, for all the reasons we talked about? I don't, I think... When you enjoy privilege, oppression or equality feels like oppression. So, what's the, it, there's what's the need for change when we're all feeling pretty comfy and cozy? And I, I think again, this this comes back to a societal issue. It's behavioral change. It's what do we believe, despite you know uh, Angela Merkel's leadership. The uh, I don't know if any of you are familiar with something called the ideal worker theory. But the ideal worker, it's, it's, you know, it's, this theory is from many years ago now, but many of the aspects still stand, which is that the ideal worker is a white male who would basically do anything for his career, right? If he has to stop a vacation short to go back to the office, if he has to miss a baseball game, if he has to miss a dance recital, if whatever. Um, and we still, that is still pervasive in society. But it's, you know, I, I appreciate your question because I think it comes full circle back to, well, maybe we just need quotas. And maybe we do. I mean, I would like to think we don't, but I, there are days where I lose hope. Well, no, no, we're finished. But you, you I get... I to make a comment about the question. Uh, Germany does have a statutory gender quota. For yeah, that's what I thought. Quotas. Yeah. Oh, that's okay. It's 30%, isn't it? Okay. Uh, yeah, it's just it's not... It's not taking hold yet. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that was just recent. That's right. I think it was recently imposed. Um, so I guess we'll okay. see what effect it has. Thank you. Uh, I want to, on behalf of Ryerson, thank you. Yeah, thank it's you. It's 4.30, and we're now, you have some booze up there, like wine and stuff like that. <laughs> and is it mandatory they show up, uh, or? Uh, yeah. No, you don't have to show up. Well, we'd like you to show up. You get asked. Don't make it question. mandatory, or people won't want to come. <laughs> Ah, I said, I'm old school here. You don't show up, you fail. But that's, oh, I got to give you a gift here. This is from Ryerson. On behalf of Ryerson, this is for you. Tanya, thank you very much. Thank you.